Can marijuana use cause mental illness? And if it can, how does it affect the teenage brain? In this video, you'll hear from Laura Stacks of Johnny's Ambassadors as she shares the latest research on the link between cannabis use and psychosis, especially for the developing brain. Hey, it's Clint with Sandstone Care, where we help teens, young adults, and their families overcome challenges connected with substance use, addiction, and mental health conditions. All right, let's get right to it. When a child is born, they have in their brain just billions of neurons. And in the book, I talk about it like if you think of it like a jungle, right? The brain's first job is to cut paths through the jungle and connect the neurons and make synapses so that the brain can communicate. Then as the child grows, the next part is called pruning. And they cut off parts of the jungle where those paths are not taken. So if you play basketball, but you don't play the piano, the path to play the piano might be pruned away. And this is good. You want pruning to occur. It's kind of the use it or lose it um, type of thing. It helps the brain be more efficient. And then the pathways um, called myelination that are used a lot are then reinforced in the brain, right? They're myelinated, they're insulated. It's almost like putting a sheath of insulation over a wire um, so that they are fast and it helps um, the transmission. So Johnny, for example, was very good in math. He could do math in his head so blazing fast, it would stun you. Um, and so this process is going on until for girls, the age of 25 and boys, they're now saying up to age 28. Some experts are even saying 30 that the brain is developing. So inside the brain, this is where it gets a little complex. There are a series of receptors. And they uh, if you think of the receptor like a lock, there are neurotransmitters that are like keys, right? That unlock the receptor. So in our natural bodies, we have a chemical called anandamide. And it is known as the runner's high. For example, it makes you feel good. It's Sanskrit for pure bliss. It's the happy neurotransmitter. Well, in the THC, in the cannabis plant, tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, which is the psychoactive ingredient of cannabis, that molecule, THC, and anandamide both fit that same lock it tricks the body into thinking it's the natural thing. Thus, our system was named the endocannabinoid system. The timing was just really bad. And some people go, oh, look at that. Our bodies are made to fit the THC molecule in. So THC molecule and our natural molecule, anandamide, are so similar that THC can come in, circumvent the system, and get into the lock and unlock it. The problem is it's so strong, it's unregulated by the body. It shoots off abnormally high levels of dopamine. It binds to that receptor, which are called CB1, cannabinoid 1 receptors in the brain, and it prevents our natural chemicals from being able to get in, and it stays there. So the THC stays in the body for a very long time. Anandamide disperses very quickly, naturally. So as the teen uses, it needs more and more and more of this THC just to feel normal because it no longer is making the natural feel-good chemical called anandamide. So when THC is introduced into that brain that is supposed to be forming, pruning, myelinating, that whole process is completely disrupted. So there is brain damage, literally structural damage, growth is arrested, and the locations where those CB1 receptors are no longer function the way they are supposed to. So for example, the amygdala, 
the amygdala is a region of the brain that regulates emotion. And so normally, if you see a bear, right, your endocannabinoid system would alert you to have adrenaline, to feel fear, right? Well, when THC gets into that, it, it sets it off at extreme levels and you get what? Panic, anxiety, paranoia, right? This is where a lot of the you're like paranoid thinking people are watching me who are using marijuana come from. So it affects the brain in extreme ways. Uh, we know with MRIs that the prefrontal cortex, for example, has CB1 receptors that in the brain between the ages of 14 and 19, when they took their MRI scans, depending upon how many times they had used marijuana over their lifetime, that prefrontal cortex got thinner and thinner and thinner, structurally different. So versus a parent, an adult, who has already formed all of their brain, that youth brain is still growing and it's plastic and it can be permanently altered by that THC. And so if you continue to use and, for example, have this paranoid kind of psychotic episode, then you, you know that your brain is very influenced um, by THC and you should never use it again. We have many people... Um, who reach out to Johnny's Ambassadors, whose son or daughter, usually boys, um, have had a psychotic episode. They go to the emergency room. They're in full-blown psychosis. They they get them um, out, get the THC out. They, they stabilize. Most of them can be just fine if they never use again. The problem is like Johnny, they sometimes use again. And those repeated psychosis, going into psychosis, out of psychosis, eventually that can convert into more of a schizoaffective disorder, a schizophrenia type diagnosis. So that is how mental illness is actually caused by THC in the brain. That's, and it's not that it's never gonna hurt an adult. I, you know, we just don't focus on adults in our work. Um, there's, there's no situation where marijuana is harmless for anybody, but it's much, much worse in adolescents whose brains are forming. So that's really the message that we are trying to get across when I go to schools and talk to teens, you know, scare tactics don't work, you know, don't use it because I said so don't work, you know, you know, your brain, is, you know, you know, your brain on eggs, you know, the egg commercial where this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. That's it. That stuff doesn't work. When you talk to young people and treat them with respect and with intelligence and actually explain the neuroscience and show them the photos of the MRIs and explain what they're doing to their minds when the THC enters, that's like, they are, they are so shocked, right? And this is your only brain you have. This is it, you know? And, and we teach them that you need to treat your brain like your BFF, right? It's, that is the only one you're going to have. And here's what happens when you use. Um, they can recover, uh, but half of the time they don't, Clint. It becomes... Uh, and there's so many negative outcomes we could go over, but. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things you're reminding me of is I talked with Dr. Jess Shackin, who wrote the book Born to be Wild, and he talks about teen risk behavior, right? And he, he talks about, you know, the documentary Scared Straight. And when we think about trying to scare or to pressure or to use facts to be able to dissuade people from doing things doesn't work very well, right? Uh, so one of, the, one of the things that he talks about is, is pairing facts with emotion and with empathy. And here's what I mean. So, you know, it's playing out what would actually happen should these things occur and asking the teen or the young adult to play it out, right? Not, not saying like, this is gonna happen to you and then this is gonna happen to you. It's like saying, hey, so apparently these high THC forms of marijuana they can interrupt your ability to, to produce this feel-good normal chemical that keeps you like happy and balanced. So what do you think is gonna happen to you if you no longer have that chemical? 
right? And having them play through this in their mind and then then what happens and then then what happens and then then what happens. And so that they're empathetically able to see where they're going on this pathway compared to, hey, like, like, let me tell you from step one to step five. And it's the parent's job to do this, right? Like it's the parent's job to have not just one, but multiple conversations, a continuing conversation about this because it's in order for us to be able to like make an impact, it does have to be formed through empathy and that does have to have a relationship. If you want to learn more about treatment options for you, your teen or young adult, then tell us about your situation on a confidential call using the number linked up in the description box below or live chat with us at sandstonecare.com. We'll connect you with the treatment that you need and if we're not the right fit, we'll get you where you need to go. Be well and remember that change is possible.